Welcome to part nine of Ask a Four Five Anything, where I will be taking questions from my Q and A chat in my Discord. I'll leave a link to that down in the description below, and I'll be presenting my answers in a very lightly edited and actually 100% unscripted type of video such as this. So if you guys want to have your question answered, please hop into that Discord and drop a question in the channel Q and A with Mark. Let's get started. Stone is asking, Io Mark, got a question for you. What you munching on the day before match and the hours before match, much appreciated. So all Taco Bell jokes aside, I do carb load the night before, assuming it's not a super early match the next day. And then about an hour and a half or an hour before the actual tennis match, the very first tennis match of the day, whether or not it's a single tennis match or uh, a possibly all day or all weekend tournament, I will eat about a banana. Actually, I would say I eat two bananas about an hour and a half before my very first match. So hopefully you guys take some inspiration for that. Uh, uh, carb loading is uh, fairly effective, at least for my body type. And a lot of people that I've talked to also do the exact same thing with pretty good results. But again, literally every body is different. So I guess my advice to you is work what is best for you and your body and your lifestyle. Much appreciated. Rural Junior is asking, what do you think about snobbery and elitism in tennis? This is a very good question. I'm surprised people, not only in my Discord, but also YouTube, they don't talk about this more often. This was actually such a big topic that me and Matt and Ian from Essential Tennis actually did a podcast on this. I will release that podcast in video format on my channel in the next, I believe, week or two because we do go in depth about 35 to 45 minutes about the snobbery, the elitism, and I believe the word I used for this podcast that we recorded is called actually privilege. So once that's up, we go into very good detail about that not only from my point of view, but also from Ian's and Matt's. So if you guys think that there is any type of snobbery or elitism in tennis, or if you don't think there is, leave a comment down in the section below. I'd like to hear your guys' thoughts. Thanks, Rural. Tag is asking, is there a best place to start when stringing the mains? So I'm kind of guilty on this um, every now and then, and I'm perfectly okay, you know, confessing it to you guys. <laughs> this, I guess it's a confessional now. Um, Whenever you're stringing a racket, whether it's a main or a cross, you want to be as close to the grommet as humanly possible. And sometimes I do slack, sometimes I get a little bit lazy because we're all human beings. But tag, that's the best answer I could give you in a broad sense of the term. Just get as close to the grommet as humanly possible when stringing both mains and crosses. Thanks. Wafs is asking if I play any other sports. Currently, no, I do not. Um, back when I was growing up, I played baseball, I played volleyball and I could have done track and field, but I didn't. I believe I quit volleyball when I was in eighth grade. I did it from sixth grade through eighth grade. It was a fun time. And then I did baseball just like every other American out there. I believe from like third grade, actually it was more like T-ball when I was in kindergarten. So I did kind of the baseball route from kindergarten all the way through, I would say freshman year in high school. And, you know, I, I dropped off of it because I wanted to concentrate more on tennis. Um, but a very good cross sport for tennis, in my opinion, is actually soccer. Because soccer players have already have the footwork, they have the foot coordination, and most of all, they have the stamina and the agility and the speed and the change of direction in order to be a successful singles and doubles tennis player. Kurt Dog is asking if I have been looking at changing my stream platform from YouTube Live to Twitch? This is a very complicated question, and luckily for me, I actually did the research. I'm not gonna go into full detail of it, but I personally believe that Jeff Bezos and the other head honchos at Amazon bought Twitch a few years ago just for a quick buck because the user experience on Twitch, especially from the consumer side, the people watching, the streamers, it's not very good. The discoverability is horrible and there's way too many ad placements. I'm not saying YouTube Live doesn't have its problems, it does. But from the research I've done from independent people, these big, big streamers 
have all agreed that Twitch is not exactly the best bet for streaming as a platform. Where YouTube Live has, yes, it has problems, but YouTube Live is the best bet for long-term streaming and long-term growth as not only a YouTube content creator such as myself, but also as a YouTube streamer. So Kurt Dog, I could definitely go into more detail on that. That is a very good question. I definitely appreciate it, but I just don't want this Q&A session to take an hour and a half. So appreciate your thoughts. Stud Puffin is asking another very good question, not exactly tennis oriented. What are some of the challenges of being a YouTuber? And just like with the previous question, I could definitely go into more detail on this because this is not just tennis related, but I feel like because I've been doing this for about nine months now, I have a lot of good information and a lot of good guidance to give you guys. Sorry, my nose is kind of running. I went on a two mile run today in 45 degree weather right before I got here. So um, one of the things, uh, challenges of being a YouTuber is um, having the guts to actually put yourself out for other people to criticize. It's not as bad as you actually think it is, but it still is definitely a challenge because right now I am just a human being talking to a camera, but there's so much more that goes on behind the scenes like the scripting, the editing, the scheduling, the publishing, the marketing of these YouTube videos. And for me, the marketing for me as a human being to you guys. So the biggest challenge I would say for any normal human being in order to become even a part-time YouTuber with relative success is the idea of rejection. Luckily for me, I already was, and I, if you actually can think about it, I still am in the sales business, but I did go in the sales uh, career for my full-time job quite a few years ago for about three or four years. So rejection for me was kind of ingrained in the back of my head and it made me a better human being. It made me a better professional. It made me a tougher individual to deal with in a good way. So. The follow-up to this question of this complicated question is actually one from Jill. And Jill's asking, how did I learn all the video editing skills? So the, one of the other challenges of being a YouTuber is learning how to basically learn. Because keep in mind, I have an undergrad in business finance. I am actually now a software engineer until I become a full-time YouTuber, which is hopefully sooner than later. But also, I have no editing skills as of nine years ago. I didn't know how to even record a YouTube. I didn't even know what these numbers on a lens was. I didn't even know what a DSLR camera was. So it's doing the research and learning from other already successful content creators out there, whether it's YouTube or Googling it. It's just being able to learn on the fly and also being okay with being wrong, sometimes absolutely wrong. So again, Jill and Stud Puffin, like, you know, very good questions. I want to get into super depth of it, but this video is not appropriate for that. So if you want, guys, I will do a more in-depth video on how to actually become a YouTuber, literally starting from scratch, actually. So uh, leave a comment down below if you guys want to, if you guys want to, me to dive into that. Thank you. Mr. Frog is asking, what string do you recommend a 13 year old? and you've been playing about five to six years. Um, depending on your level, I would actually say that I would start with a hybrid and then go from there. When people ask me this question, it's very hard for me to, to narrow it down because there are 13 year olds that could literally beat me 6161. And there are 13 year olds out there that you know are just starting to play tennis. So even if you've been playing tennis for five to six years, I need to get an idea of what your, I guess, level of play is, how fast you're swinging, I guess UTR is probably the best way to do it or whether or not if you're in 13, so middle school, like, you know, where you would be in a typical high school, whether it's JV or varsity. So that's kind of hard to narrow down. So I would say start with a hybrid setup, something soft like uh, Yonex Polytour Pro on the mains and then uh, Wilson Sensation on the crosses. If the Yonex Polytour Pro is a little bit out of your price range, ISO Speed Baseline Control is a pretty damn good budget string, Mr. Frog. So let me know how that goes for you. Love to help you out. GTRVN is asking, ball machine or coach? Okay, so let's break this down. I think coaching is actually the more important attribute in this question, GTRVN. And don't make the mistake of believing that you need to have weekly private lessons on the regular in order to be a good tennis player. There's other great 
free resources out there for learning how to hit a proper forehand or learning when to hit a proper forehand and even tennis strategy which is you know a next level type of thinking when it comes to a sport there's plenty of resources that are free out there on youtube one of them being essential tennis obviously so go check out essential tennis he's a good friend of mine ian runs a really amazing youtube channel at about 250k subs and he's been doing this for about 10 years as for the ball machine, you don't necessarily need a ball machine in order to get the repetition. If there is a good network of players around your level with a good amount of uh, free or relatively cheap court time for both outdoors and indoors, I don't think a ball machine is necessary. You just need to have good people skills and you need to be willing to be able to network with people and that might be slightly out of your comfort zone, but it's a good life skill nonetheless. So. If you can't reach out and have a good pool of hitting partners on a regular basis, yes, buy a ball machine. If not, a ball machine, in my opinion, is probably not the best bet. Have as many people and as many hitting partners in your phone book as you could possibly have GTPR in. Thank you. And if you guys haven't already, hit like, hit subscribe, and consider hitting that notification bell to be notified of brand new YouTube content from this channel. <sighs> And as always, happy hitting.